It's time for crazy experiments in the media division. Today, we are going to redefine what it means to shoot wide open. That means we're going to walk in the footsteps of Stanley Kubrick and we're going to shoot with ultra fast lenses. That means lenses that are faster than f1 and right down to f0.7. Some lenses are bigger than others and an f0.7 lens gathers four times more light than an already fast f1.4 lens. That means amazing low light capabilities, dreamy bokeh and razor thin depth of field. We are going to take you to the dark side of the moon, the realm of the legendary Zeiss Planar f0.7 lens and explain how it helps Stanley Kubrick to shoot Barry Lyndon using nothing but candlelight. We are going to go to the basics to explore the possibilities and to expose the limitations of ultrafast lenses. We look into the possibilities that you have to shoot ultra-fast yourself, including the monster of light gathering, the Zeiss Biota F0.73 for the adventurers among you. We show you how we build a working F0.7 system and take you along on our shooting, where we put our speed king to the test and compare the more practical options. We also compare shooting ultra-fast lenses with shooting at high ISO and of course, using both in combination. Last but not least, we're going to explore the budget option, using a speed booster to achieve speeds below F1. Whether you're a filmmaker or a photographer, this should be interesting. So get some popcorn, lean back and open wide. The entrance pupil of a lens in combination with its focal length determines how much light that lens can gather. The wider lens can open up, the brighter the image it projects can be. We use the analogy of speed to describe this quality. A lens that gathers a lot of light is a fast lens. Normal fast lenses usually top out at f1.4 and there are lenses that reach speeds of f1. F1 is one step faster than f1.4. That means on the same focal length, the entrance pupil of that lens is twice as big and it shines twice the amount of light on the sensor of the negative. We call lenses that are f1 or even below that ultra fast. As always, nature was way ahead of us with fast vision. Nocturnal predators like the owl combine high sensitivity retinas with fast optics. While a human eye is rated around 2.1 wide open, the eye of an owl is about f1.3 and admits more than twice the amount of light, even though they are considerably smaller. Ultra-fast lenses are a bit like the unicorns of lenses. As for classic full-frame SLR and DSLR systems, there aren't any. We assumed that they were extremely hard to design and too expensive. This idea was mostly fueled by the legendary Zeiss Planar, uh, f0.7 and maybe the Leica Noctilux f0.95. Shooting ultra fast is always a bit challenging for the filmmaker and for his wallet. But if you are willing to be a bit adventurous, there are affordable options out there. In the later parts of this video, we will show and compare some of those. Wikipedia has an illustrious list of fast lenses on their page about lens speed. Here you will find lenses that are f1 and faster. And the larger the format, the rarer and more expensive they get. We will explain later why it's easier to build a fast lens for a smaller format. The Leica Noctilux f 095 is deemed the best ultra-fast lens that one could actually buy for a whooping $11,000. Canon's 50mm f1 is the fastest lens around that has a long flange and could therefore still be used with a focal reducer. For $5,000 it can be yours. Used, of course, as Canon stopped to produce it. Lately, there has been some new contenders. Nikon has released the Noct, a really good-looking full-frame lens with f0.95 for an eye-watering $9,000. The good news is that there have been some relatively affordable options with the Kippon Ebolux f0.85 
for $1,500 and the SLR Magic 25mm T0.95 for only $500. We are going to test both of those. Another possibility is to go for vintage lenses. Here we are going to try one of the fastest lenses in the world, the Zeiss Biota 100mm f0.73, a lens used in X-ray machines. And of course, we are going to talk about the brute force option, boosting a fast lens below f1 using focal reducers. For this test we are going to use another vintage lens, a Canon FD 55mm f1.2. All lenses faster than f1.0 have one thing in common, they are all for systems with short flange. That means systems where the rare optical elements are very close to the negative or sensor, so rangefinder or mirrorless cameras. An interesting fact that you should keep in mind. The most famous ultrafast lens, or maybe even the most famous lens in general, is probably the 50mm Zeiss Planar f0.7, a lens shrouded in legends. It was designed in 1966 by Carl Zeiss in Germany for NASA to be used on the Apollo missions. But there is no information available which mission the lens actually flew and none of the images it took is actually available to the public. We can tell you this much. If you see a fancy photo from the surface, these have not been shot with the Planar F0.7 and it would have been pretty close to being useless because the direct sunlight requires the lens to be stopped down quite a bit. Also a deep depth of field was desired. Here NASA used another size lens, the 60mm Bigoton F5.6. The size Planar F0.7 was used on a modified Hasselblad camera that remained in orbit and was used to photograph the night side of the moon. Not the dark side of the moon, that's a Pink Floyd album. Let us explain that briefly. The moon is in a gravitational lock with Earth, meaning that we always see the same side, that we call the near side. Just like Earth, half of the moon is illuminated by the sun. As the moon orbits around the Earth in one month, you have two weeks of sunlight followed by two weeks of night. The side of the moon that always faces away from Earth is called the far side and it's only observable from the moon's orbit. As the moon's face doesn't change drastically during the time of a mission, half of the moon is only illuminated by the light reflected by the Earth and by starlight. As Earth is not as good as a reflector as the moon is, that is not a lot of light. So either you come again during another moon phase or you will need a very fast lens. Enter the 50mm Zeiss Planar f0.7. Zeiss only built 10 lenses, of which they kept one. And you can see it in a museum if you ever come to southern Germany. The Planar f0.7 was fitted on a specially modified Hasselblad camera. This lets us make one assumption. The Planar was actually designed for medium format cameras, which makes its speed even more impressive. The legendary moon lens and its capabilities in low light attracted Stanley Kubrick, who planned to shoot some scenes of Barry Lyndon only illuminated by candles, creating a unique realistic and yet poetic look that won an Oscar for cinematography and is still considered one of the most iconic visuals in the medium today. With modern camera sensors, it doesn't seem to be an overly hard task to shoot with only candlelight, but in 1975 the film negative had only 100 ISO. Now try to light that with candles. To be fair, Kubrick and his DOP John Alcott pulled some tricks. They pushed the film to 200 ISO during development and used special candles that had three wicks, burning three times brighter than a normal candle would. Also, they used metal deflectors under the ceiling, primarily to protect the delicate architecture from the extra hot three wick candles, but it also provided a boost to the candlelight. Still, even with the fastest cine lenses of his time, which were about f1, he still needed twice the amount of light to get acceptable exposure. And this is where the Planar f0.7 was the saving grace. And a huge pain on many levels. First and foremost, it required a flange of about 4mm to focus to infinity. To put that in perspective, a Sony E-mount has 18mm flange. Of course Kubrick filmed with a classic 35mm camera, a Mitchell BNC, and these cameras have a rolling shutter and a mirror for a viewfinder between the lens and the negative. 
Also, the planar was way too big to fit into the mound. A seemingly impossible task. But Kubrick wasn't somebody who would take no for an answer. He had the Mitchell cut out in the front to fit the lens. He altered the shutter so it would only require 3mm to operate and he got rid of the mirror, which of course made the operator blind to whatever he was shooting. A TV camera was placed at a 90 degrees angle to the Mitchell and was monitored on a TV screen mounted above the camera lens scale. A grid placed on the TV screen gave the first AC critical distance information. One of the many times where Kubrick didn't only advance cinema with his unique way of telling a story, but also by reinventing the gear he used. Barry Lyndon is by no means the only example for shooting with candlelight. Later films like Amadeus shot concert scenes using primarily candles to light the scenes. This time not only because of a visual theme, but because the historical concert hall in Prague had no electric wiring and the government refused the film crew to lay high voltage cables, afraid it could damage the priceless building. To cope with the fire hazard, so many firemen had to be in the room that they were impossible to hide. The solution? They were simply put in costume and used as extras. Brilliant. Milos Forman had it much easier than Kubrick though. By the time Amadeus was produced, the film stock had become considerably more sensitive and 250 ISO stock was used for those scenes. The advances in technology and higher sensitivity in digital sensors allow us to shoot in candlelight with less effort. But high ISO delivers a completely different look compared to ultrafast lenses. We will talk about that later. Going back to the planar and the stony road it was to adapt the lens to a film camera. Why did the planar have a flange of only 4mm? Wouldn't it have been easier to modify the lens instead of the camera? This is where we go into the basics of lens design and lens speed. Bear with us, it's worth to know and you're going to need this information for our experiment. The F number of an optical system is calculated by this formula. F number equals F divided by D. The F stands for the focal length of a lens. The D is the diameter of the entrance pupil. While the focal length is pretty straightforward and usually written on that lens, the entrance pupil needs some explanation. Quite often you hear that the entrance pupil is the diameter of the lens's front element. Often you hear that the diameter of the iris itself is what counts. And neither is correct. The entrance pupil is how large the iris opening appears to be when viewed to the optical system it is in. And that is by no means the same as the actual size. Let us show you. These are two Mamiya medium format lenses. On the left there is an 80mm f1.9 and on the right side is a 45mm f2.8. On a long focal length the entrance pupil looks large. Removing the front element reveals a smaller iris than the appearance suggested. On a short focal length the entrance pupil looks small. Removing the front element reveals a larger iris than the appearance suggested. This is the reason why wide angle lenses are not always ridiculously fast when you apply the F number formula. As both values become smaller simultaneously, the resulting brightness remains in the same ballpark. But how does this relate to the flange distance at all? That has to do with the refraction of air. And this refraction sets an absolute limit. I don't want to bore you with too much details here, but this formula shows the limit close to F1 for systems with longer flanges like EF, F, PL, whereas lenses for rangefinder mirrorless cameras can be faster. You could think of it like this. This would be a 50mm F1 lens on an EF mount. A faster lens would have a larger entrance pupil. The mount would need a larger opening and infinity focus would wander to the front. One way to achieve a working system is to move the sensor forward. Basically, what mirrorless systems do. An f0.7 lens would have a 1.4 times larger entrance pupil, requiring such a short flange that there is no room for conventional mount. Of course, faster lenses can be used with longer flanges if infinity focus ability is not required, but in this case, a lens is not branded as such. The maximum aperture must reach infinity focus. Due to the refraction of air, f0.7 seems to be the practical limit, while f0.5 is the theoretical roadblock, as this will come up. On the Wikipedia list of fast lenses you will find an American optical 81mm f0.38. That seems to defy what we just shown you. There's very little information to find about this lens, but the Solid Schmidt mirror lens 
from 1939 seems to be a solid glass camera with an integrated mirror lens that avoids the limitation by eliminating the air from the system. As there has been no further development since, we assume that it was not worth it. There's one more lens that will pop up in the comments for sure. The Carl Zeiss SuperQ Gigantar 40mm f0.33. It was never a working lens, but a marketing stunt that might have had the right numbers to give f0.33 on paper, but it was never able to produce a usable image. Zeiss wanted to show the absurdity of hunting after ever faster lenses, and the Q in the name stands for Quatsch, the German word for nonsense. Our takeaway from this is that the lens has to get physically larger and larger with faster speeds, especially with longer focal length in larger formats. A larger lens requires much more glass. The lenses get heavy, really heavy. May we introduce you to the star destroyer of lenses, the Zeiss Biotar R 100mm f0.73. It dwarfs even very fast lenses like the SLR Magic 25mm T0.95 and has a huge front element that seems to bend space-time when you look through it. It weights a hefty 5.8 kg, so if you're not running a full-fledged Alexa, you are going to mount the camera to the lens and not the other way around. The lens is designed to fit specifically into its environment. There's no iris, as these lenses are supposed to operate at maximum aperture. There are no moving elements for focusing, and there's no mount in the conventional sense. The backside is just a flat piece of glass, but don't be misled. This is not some kind of protection glass, but the back of a massive Plano convex lens that again is part of a doublet. It was built in 1964, around the same time as the NASA Planar. As an industrial lens, with limited practical applications, you can buy them for somewhat reasonable prices, and eBay has listings at about $500 at this time. The ground glass from a large format camera makes the lens protection visible, and the brightness is very promising. Changing the distance of objects reveals the focal plane that the lens generates for the given focal flange between the ground glass and the rear lens element. When we alter the flange, we can demonstrate how we are going to focus the lens. When we increase the flange, we can focus on objects that are very close. When we reduce the flange, we can focus on objects further away. The candles are about 3 meters away. And here you can see that focusing to 3 meters already requires a flange distance of something like 10 millimeters, rendering any traditional mount or helicoid useless. The ground glass also allows us to demonstrate the coverage. This is 4x5 large format. This is IMAX and we see that it is covered. All smaller formats are subsequently covered. To put it in perspective, this is full frame, this is 4 perforation super 35, and this is micro for third. The R in the name indicates that the Biotar is a so-called X-ray lens. The R stems from the German word for X-ray, Röntgenstrahlung. The Wikipedia list of fast lenses has a section for X-ray lenses, and you will find that the Biotar is the fastest of these lenses, and the biggest. Let us explain briefly what an X-ray lens is. First of all, don't worry, these lenses are not radioactive as long as they don't use thoriated glass, and even then it wouldn't be harmful. These lenses were not used to transmit X-rays. X-ray machines shine electromagnetic radiation through a body. As the bones are denser than the soft tissue, they block more of the radiation, and the skeleton casts a shadow. As X-rays are invisible, a fluorescent screen is used to produce a temporal image. This image was then shot by an ordinary camera in the system. The faster the lens of the camera is, the shorter and less intense the X-ray burst needed to be, being less harmful for the patient. Many more modern X-ray machines use smaller CCD sensors, like they are used in video cameras to show a permanent image instantaneously. Of course, these lenses don't cover full frame or even Super 35 sensors, so if you should go hunting for X-ray lenses, be very careful with those. You will find some advice in the description of this video. As we want to use the Biotar on a filming environment, we will need to find a way to safely mount it to a rig. We modded a Lunpart mat box to fit the front of the lens. The back is held up by a Lunpart lens support that also prevents the lens from sliding out of the mat box. We happen to have the most sensitive Cinecam in the market right now. 
the Kinefinity Marvo LF. A very cool feature is that you can remove the mount. It has a dual native ISO with 800 and 5120. More importantly, it has a full frame sensor to get as much from the massive image projection as possible. By the way, the red surface you can see is actually not the sensor, but the OLPF. Bias sensors require the softening effect of such a filter to avoid more. The filter appears to be red, as it's also a hot mirror, that means that it reflects infrared light. This was shot with a biota with a flange of E-mount. The focal plane is about 50 cm away, and with a 100 mm focal length you can barely fit a human face in the frame, which is why you often see X-ray lenses used for very, very blurry macrophotography. So how do we achieve the ultra-short flange? Just like Kubrick found out the hard way, it's all about modding. Not the lens, but the camera. What follows is not for the faint of heart, and we advise you not to do this yourself. To achieve infinite focus with a Beata, we are going to mod the camera in a quite drastic way. We are going to pull the sensor out of the camera. So if you're a bit anal about dust on your sensor, you might want to pop out for a minute. And if you think that this is somehow wrong, or that we hate our camera, that is not the case. We just like to be bold and to experiment for ourselves and for you. Like Kubrick, we don't take no for an answer. We remove the submount from the camera and remove the OLPF. So you can see, the OLPF just in itself would have been thicker than the required 4mm. Now we detach the sensor holder and the sensor unit. After reattaching the heatsink with gaff, we pull the sensor through the opening of the sensor holder and attach the sensor from the outside using gaff. We are now lacking an OLPF and basic filtration of infrared. We can live without the OLPF as a wide open lens is very soft in itself, but not without filtration. Of course, we could use a large hot mirror in front of the lens, but those would not be designed for the specific needs of the sensor and most probably ruin the colors recorded on the camera. During our research, we came across Colari Vision, a company specialized in infrared conversions, infrared and UV filters, custom mods, consulting and more. And they have a product range of very thin filter arrays that are designed to fit a specific sensor. Why would anybody need those filters? They are designed to replace the much thicker OEM filters and allow to achieve better performance on cameras using wide vintage lenses. Wide vintage lenses are not telecentric, meaning that rays hit the sensor at quite an angle. Now the travel distance behind the OLPF is not conform, and the edges of the image start to get blurry and smeary. A very thin filter array can prevent that. Colari Vision was kind enough to support our experiment and send us a filter free of charge. Thanks a lot Colari, we appreciate you where no man has gone before attitude. If you are a friend of vintage glass, a Colari filter might give you the edge-to-edge -edge sharpness you are looking for. If you are interested in that, or infrared, or UV imaging in general, please visit the website under colarivision.com. I will also put that link in the description. To avoid Newton rings and scratching the sensor, the Colari filter is attached leaving a small space between the surface using double-sided tape. As this procedure is quite nerve-wracking and I used the wrong tape leaving some residue around the sensor surface, I'm not going to repeat this process on camera. We will find a cleaner to get rid of the residue, but it doesn't affect the sensor performance at all. We then use the same tape to attach the Colari filter to a simple clear filter for protection and attached everything with gaff. A solution that is not pretty, but surprisingly solid. And it worked. To be clear, Everything we did here is easily revertible, and we did so several times over the course of this project. Most part of this episode have been shot with a Marvel after demodding, so the camera is fully functional. The flange can vary from 110mm for close focus to 4mm for infinity focus. To be able to focus with precision, we modded a Manfrotto macro slider. We had the bold plan to make the slider remote controllable. Maja is an SFX technician at the Marmalade, this guy. And he wears sunshades because he's looking into an 18K HMI. And he did a fantastic job to actually build a system from scratch. 3D printing and all. Absolutely next level. Unfortunately, the corona crisis led to a lockdown and Maciej was not able to be with us and to attach the controller. So we had to use this little work of art manually. Anyway, thank you so much, man. Now we attach the whole unit to a rig and voila. A system that can focus from close to infinity and is as practical as it gets with this monstrosity. 
While it is heavy and the depth of field is non-existent, we will still do some handheld work with it, because we are just us. After getting through all of this, it's time to show you what we got. This is the mission, shot completely in candlelight at f0.7 and ISO 800. We're now going to take you a bit backstage and tell you about the problems and the solution during the shoot. We will also give you a bit of our resume. After that we are not done at all. We will test some affordable and practical ultra-fast lenses in the candle set, as well as taking one into an ultra-low light situation to pair it with a very high ISO. But first, some channel related stuff. If you like our work, please like this video and consider subscribing. And don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. If you want to see what we are cooking in the future and a bit of behind the scenes, you can follow us on Instagram. If you are more into in-depth discussions and community, we have a closed Facebook group for just that. Links are in the description. Brand new to this channel is membership. Our productions are quite complex. An advertisement on YouTube doesn't cover a fraction of our investment, never mind our time. We still love to do it and to have you around. You can support our work and enable us to spend more time and to put out episodes more frequently. We have three tiers of membership inspired by directors we love. All memberships can be cancelled at any time. Our supporter tier is the Scott. Here you can show us some love and give us your support with 99 cents per month. Your name will appear in the end credits of future episodes. Next is our team tier, the Lynch, for $3.99. You will get access to selected footage, project files, LUTs and Photoshop documents related to our latest episodes. This time we will give away an action pack with LUTs for the Blackmagic Ursa Mini, Panasonic EVA 1 and Kininfinity Marmola F that have been used in this episode. Also we will give away the After Effects project files for the moon animation, including the high res UV map of the surface. We will include a footage package from the X-ray skeleton from this episode that you are free to use for any project that you desire. Our pro tier is the Kubrick for $9.99 and you will get consultation. Just ask anything and we will try our best to support you within a 48 hour time frame. If you have some special needs for the content of our episodes, just ask. Also, you get a personal shout out in our episodes, either for you or your company. 
Of course, you will get access to the same action packs as the Lynch tier. And if you think these guys don't need support with their fancy studios and robots, these are not ours. We just happen to have very generous friends in the Marmalade. They are a high-end production house that produces visuals that are out of this world. They were so kind to produce our channel intro with us. We have a complete episode about how this was done. Link is in the corner. And they have a very unique community of creatives that gives access to a world of possibilities like I have never experienced it before. This is the melting pot for abilities, ideas and gear for the next level results. Please consider becoming a member of the media division and be a part of the chocolate factory for filmmakers. Special thanks go out to Linton Gall, one of the directors of The Marmalade. He has been an essential part of this episode, not only for being our model for the lens test, but with everything from set design to the tabletop shots right up to post effects. My favorite is the one right in the end of this episode. You will see. Linton even took some personal loss in the production of this episode. Ow. I know. Shit. What? Oh, 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 shit. It healed immediately. And it is a nice shirt. It was a nice shirt. Thanks a lot, Linton. You are one of a kind. And I'm pretty sure you're a vampire. Is this, this, is, is this there on uh, because or just because? Well, it's there because. Obviously, um, we have a problem with uh, light spilling in from the side, right? Light comes in. And we have a very, very elegant solution for this. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> To share a bit of our insights and what to expect shooting at F0.7, we are now going to take you backstage on our shoot. First we played around with the position of the candles and camera until we find something that we like and something that the lens likes. Unexpected was a strange effect making practical light sources wonky when in focus. An effect that gets worse with greater subject distance. So this is obviously something that um, Kubrick had to fight, not had to fight. So the planar doesn't do this uh, candle out of focus effect. So when a light source shines directly into the lens, um, it will get from a certain distance very weird out of focus effects. Um, everything else is quite beautiful, uh, but this has to do with the lens design of the Biotar, so the Planar is definitely a different lens on that, uh, in that area. An expected problem was dealing with the extreme shallow depth of field. Especially in close-ups, there's a definite difference between the tip of an eyelash and the iris of an eye. It's like a difference between the hair here and your... your... You can have to really, really go like... They said, like, even if you move just a millimeter or something like that, it, it, when you this close focus, you are going to be too close. Try to stay on the same focal plane, right? Ah, that's a little difficult. Yeah. So you just move sideways. This is exactly what, what Kubrick had to do with his people. A simple trick is to put a monitor close by and let the talent do the micro focus by moving back and forth, one millimeter at the time. Acting and movement should generally be designed to be on the same focal plane. One old trick for otherwise complex shots is to focus on the end position and to act in reverse. Do we have, yeah, we have critical focus. Okay, and go. And you're right, you don't see it that you walk backwards. Good call. We can then simply reverse the shot in post. And presto, you hit critical focus in a forward movement. Uh, can you walk with the lights in the back through this thing? Because then it looks like you're walking. Another trick is to have your subject stand still while his surroundings are moving and the camera is panning. He, he walks on and it just does down. Next time we, we put you... <laughs> This was the night Dorian came back and saw his picture, <laughs> right? And he lifted the candle and he saw what time and grief did to his face. Actually, it's super interesting what happens in the corners of the lens. The light breaks. Yeah, 
Ah, that's cool. Shooting handheld with this setup is pure masochism. That's why we had to try it. The system is so heavy that it requires quite some muscle power to just hold it. The vast majority of the shots are out of focus, something only feasible with digital cameras. Imagine the waste of negative if we were shooting on film. The talent has to maintain the distance to the camera as good as possible. I love it. It's very Just unusual. Because it's it's really, unusual, exactly. It's really abstract. If you if you put this lens on, you want something unusual. <laughs> no, there's no point. It needs to have character. Yeah. It needs to have a little bit of character. So they got that. It's got a lot of character. Yeah. Difficult. So the focus is in. You, you, this is. I'm, this, I'm like, look at your hair. It look is in focus. Hair. It's just bloomed. It's like putting a, a yeah. promised on. A, a, yeah, a promised like five. <laughs> yeah, it's got a promised quality about it. Yeah, but if you if you zoom in, which you can still in the playback, you should at least. Then you will see that uh, even if I go in, mm. I still have. And that's what I mean. Yeah, the focus is there. Huh? It, the focus is there. Of course we wanted to see how a fast system fares against an ultra-fast system. This should give you an idea. All of our making of shots have been shot with the Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro G2, a camera that is not great in low light, but can give good results up to 1600 ISO with a f1.4 prime. When we go down to just one candle, even at 1600 ISO, it's a bit dark now. Compare the exact same shot to the 10240 ISO and f0.7 on the Mavo. You can already see in the display that if anything we are overexposing. It looks like we are looking into a tiny HMI light, just that the HMI is a candle. On the bigger budget productions, the fabulous Wolf Hall shows that the Area Alexa in a fast prime can produce beautiful images, even if there's just very few candles in the scene, and sometimes even only one. Okay, two. And of course, there's always the option to supplement candlelight, like it has been done since the dawn of cinema. The look is very different to Barry Lyndon though. The ultra-fast lens produces a softer, more poetic look that is a nice reminiscence of oil paintings from the same time. A look that is just not replicable in post. Of course, ultra-fast lenses are not suitable for everyday use. They are special lenses for very special jobs and not practical at all, but like so often, a stony road leads to interesting results. Like the F0.7 scenes in Barry Lyndon led to an Oscar for cinematography. Ultrafast lenses can give you a tool to tell your story in a unique way, even without modding your camera. Besides the usual dream, drug and flashback scenes, how about a story of a man with Alzheimer's disease? And he loses his ability to recognize faces. He can show that with faces that fall in and out of focus using a super shallow depth of field. You might have realized that none of the shots in our sample movie actually use infinite focus. That doesn't mean it can't. It can. But I think it looks horrible. The lens was designed for close focus and this is where it shines. And that's why we decided not to use any. I want to thank my namesake Niklas Eichten from The Marmalade for filming our shooting. Nicely done, man. As our f0.7 setup is beyond anything practical, we want to take a look at lenses that can give you the ultra-fast look and light gathering abilities much simpler, even on a budget. These options are all way below f1, just not for full frame, but for Super 35 and Micro for third formats. And of course, there's always the option to use a focal reducer. We're going to put three lenses to the test. The Kippon Ibelux 40mm f0.85 Mark II, the SLR Magic 25mm T0.95 and a vintage Canon FD full frame lens with f1.2, boosted below f1. Let us start with the biggest and most expensive lens in the trio, the Kippon Ibelux 40mm f0.85 Mark II. It is designed to cover Super 35 sensors and at this time it might be the fastest lens you can buy for the format. The first time you pick up this lens you immediately realize that this is not like any of your other lenses. It is surprisingly heavy, weighing 1181 grams and you can feel the sheer amount of glass that is necessary to get the f0.85 on Super 35. The lens is fully manual and has a very sturdy metal build. Unusual is the metal lens cap that screws on and that the iris ring is in front of the focus ring. 
as fast lenses tend to flare, the lens has a built-in metal sun hood. It is available in Sony E, Leica L, Fuji X, EOS M and Micro for third mounts and costs around $1,500. We have the Mark II version, but by the time you watch this, the Mark III version with improved mechanics should be available. We think that the mechanics on the Mark II are already very good. When shooting with the lens wide open, the first thing you realize is that it produces strong oval flares with practical lights. An interesting effect, but if you have many sources like in a candlelight setup, the flares can easily overwhelm the scene. Close focus is 75 centimeters, quite far. The flares go away when you close the lens down to f1.4. At this speed, it's only as fast as normal fast primes, but very sharp. Wide open, images look much better in indirect light. The images are extremely bright and the highlights blooming is relatively low for such a high speed, making the Ebe looks the perfect lens for ultra low light shootings when combined with a sensitive camera. To try that in a real life scenario, we waited for the night to fall. While the city is never really pitch black, the path we are filming here is so dark that one has to be cautious not to stumble over things. Let's put this into perspective. This is what an iPhone 7 Plus can see with this kind of light, something close to nothing. And this is what a Sigma 18-35 boosted to f1.2 can do on a GH5. With a whooping 12800 ISO, we get something like an image that is beyond anything usable or repairable. Now, let there be light. Quite impressive, and if you think, hey, you just shot that earlier when the sun was still up, the light that the jogger is wearing is a dead giveaway that this is not the case. Again, we see the typical flares that the Ebolux produces when a light shines into it. Just illuminating my face with a 7-inch display mount on the camera gives us already a good enough exposure to film something that looks decent. The phone's flashlight will overexpose by a landslide. Bokeh looks beautiful and the sharpness in this lighting condition is nothing short of breathtaking. The Marvel does a fantastic job, even at 10,240 ISO, with very low noise in a practically dark scene. No noise reduction was applied and all we have is a mild film like grain. Some will say, yeah, nice, and why don't you light your scenes, noob? I can best imagine using this lens and camera combination in war zones or filming large nocturnal predators or for low profile documentary spying on criminals. So dear questioner, please light your scene. I can't wait to see the results. Next up is the SLR Magic 25mm T0.95 Cine 3. It is tiny in comparison. No wonder as this lens will only cover micro for third sensors and is only available in this mount. Talking about only, it weighs only 455 grams and it is designed to fit into filming environments with geared aperture and focus rings. It is also measured in T-stops instead of F-stops, taking transmission light loss into account. There is no F-stop spec available, but expect something like F0.92 for better comparability. As the Marvel F has no optional micro for third mount, we tested the SLR Magic on a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. We were instantly in love with what this camera combo can do. The images look reasonably sharp and the highlights blooming is very controlled even at maximum aperture. Flares are nice and not overwhelming in candlelight scenes. There's really nothing much not to like about this lens, except the short focus throw. That doesn't feel right in the otherwise cinecentric design approach. Closed down, it looks just as nice. Of course, it is considerably less bright compared to the Ebolux, but at the price point of only $500, this lens is a must-have for Micro Four Third owners.
The close focus is very impressive at only 25 cm, making the SLR Magic a semi-macro and a very versatile lens. Our last contender is our budget option, using something you might already own, a focal reducer. If you put a focal reducer on an already fast full-frame prime, you can build your own ultra-fast lens for crop formats like Super 35 and Micro Four Thirds. And yes, you do build a new lens with a new f-stop using a focal reducer. A lens is just an optical system and your new optical system has the same entrance pupil but a shorter focal length. Applying the f-number formula will give you a new f-stop. Usually you can apply the magnification of the reducer to calculate your new f-stop. For example, an f2 lens with a 0.7x focal reducer will result in an f1.4 lens. So does that mean we could take the Canon 50mm f1 and put on a Metabones f0.74 to get a micro for third lens with a ludicrous f0.64? Unfortunately not. Focal reducers have a speed limit for the input lens resulting in a maximum output speed. This limit is based on the flange distance and the size of the optical element. 0.7x focal reducers top out at about f0.9 and 0.64x focal reducers at about f0.8. That means that an f1.2 lens is already the fastest lens you can boost while still gaining light. We are going to use a Canon FD 55mm f1.2 because it is very fast and you can get it on eBay for around $200. It only weighs 581 grams without the booster. The FD mount is slightly shorter than EF mount and the 0.7 focal reducer from Kippon that we are going to use is for EF. We ordered a mount conversion kit for the FD but it didn't make it in time, therefore we will have to use a diopter adapter in between them. That's the blue element you see here. In conjunction, this system will get us in the F0.9 ballpark. The Kippon reducer has a slightly higher speed limit compared to the Metabone specs, but Kippon assured us that this is due to more conservative measurements and that the general design is the same. The images don't compare in terms of sharpness or clearness at all which wasn't to be expected considering the price and age of the lens, but still, this is somewhat below our expectations. Wide open, you have a lot of highlight blooming and the image is overall soft. Closing down a bit improves the sharpness, but the image is still comparably soft. It could very well be that the diopter causes problems. Anyhow, if you're looking for an extreme vintage look, this could be for you. I find the results interesting and I was immediately reminded of 70s British cinema, something like the picture of Dorian Gray. I guess this is what you call character. Kippon was nice enough to sponsor this episode in form of an Ebelux f0.85 lens. Thank you very much, Kippon. We really dig your products. We really like the uh, medium format um, focal reducer. We have a whole episode about it, using it with Mamiya vintage glasses. And if you want to see that, check that out. I put the link in the corner. If you're interested in this lens or in the focal reducers, please visit the Kippon website. I put a link in the description. This episode has been quite an adventure for us. I personally love what we got with the Biota and I'm sure it would have been even better on a larger format like IMAX. How cool would it be to do Kubrick style and modify an IMAX camera to fit it? Christopher Nolan, if you want to play, you know where to find us. In our closed Facebook group and you can join us there too for a more in-depth discussion. If you want to keep up with what we are cooking, follow us on Instagram. Links are in the description. As always, links to all the lenses gear and music used in this episode can be found in the description. Some are affiliate links, that means you don't pay more when you use them, but we get a little something for the tip jar. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please give us a like if you think we deserve one, and of course subscribe if you want to see more of it. Please consider becoming a member of this channel, because the more members we have, the more time and energy we can invest in making episodes like this. So, I'm signing out, I'm Nicholas with Nerdalicious Wishes. Shoot something 
amazing. But what's that? Oh, oh, oh dear. Oh, ah, oh. oh, fuck. Oh. <laughs>